Okay, it's busy recording, so take it away, Gavin. All right, thanks very much, Steph. Um, hope everyone can hear me clearly. I've taken a little bit of license saying that this is all new technology because actually it's been around a long time in terms of magnetics and radar. But the way we're using it and with drones as well, obviously that's the new part of it. And the way we're applying it, we feel is starting to break some ground. And that's what we've been hoping to do for a while. So without further ado, I'll get into it. So we're going to be looking at um, how using ground penetrating radar drone magnetics um, in exploration. And then maybe just have a quick slide or two a discussion on what other things we can do with drones. Before I start, I just want to say thanks very much to the rest of the GeoFocus team, Bjorn Haverman and Rian Hugo. These are the guys that go out there often and do the work. And uh, Rian particularly is always out in the field doing this great work. So I'd like to say thanks very much and acknowledge them as well. So drone magnetics, um, obviously been coming and everybody's been asking about it. Everybody's saying, when, when can we do surveys with it? Why would we do surveys with it? What benefits are there? Um, so that's what I'm going to go into. Try not to give away too many trade secrets, but it's, well, we probably will. I mean, everything is obvious from this talk. We use a Matrix 600 Pro at the moment, which is that you're seeing in the, in the picture there. It's a hexacopter, so it's got to be big enough to lift this, this mag bird, which is the geometrics mag bird. It's called the mag arrow. Um, that thing only weighs about a kilogram. And obviously you can go further and you can go bigger, but this is where we've started. We use licensed professional pilots. They're fully qualified. We don't bother with the piloting side of it. We supply the bird and we do the data um, collation, the processing, the interpretation, etc. So I'll show you a bit more about the mag arrow bird now. First of all, let me just show you what this thing looks like when it flies, because this is mostly what everybody wants to see. Hopefully you can see this video. Let me know if you can't. Here's another one. You can see how slow, how, how low this thing can fly if you've got the right terrain. You're literally two or three meters off the ground. can see we get a heck of a lot of swing, which is something one has to deal with. Right, so we're using the DJI Matrix 600 Pro hexacopter and has a lift capacity theoretically of 5.5 kilograms, but that uh, Magbird only weighs one kilogram. And you can do, you can go as fast as you like. Obviously you don't want to go too fast, but you can go as fast as 65 Ks an hour. Um, and it can take quite a bit of wind resistance because that's one of the issues that one's going to face with a drone in windy terrain, or sorry, windy weather, you're going to have problems. It includes a six battery set. Now the big issue with drones is of course the batteries, changing the batteries all the time. This one takes four at a time and we'll take a six battery set. So we've got at least 30 batteries on site. And the batteries last about 20, 25 minutes. So you've got to hot, hot change them, as they call it. And then you have to charge the batteries on site. So we have um, a bucky there, which has got a whole charging facility, a generator. And you have to cool them. They charge so fast that they get very hot. So we have fans and we have um, a fridge, in fact. Um, you obviously have to sling the mag, mag arrow about three meters below the drone, so there's no magnetic effect whatsoever from the drone, and we include an altimeter. 
which is a very small object you can put on the drone as well. Why would you do drone magnetics? I mean, we already have helicopters, we have crop sprayers, and we have ground mag. Well, the bottom line is that it fits neatly into the gap between what you can do with ground mag and what you can do with a big system like a helicopter or a crop sprayer. It's much faster than ground mag. We cover ground about seven to 10 times faster than ground magnetics, easily do 70 kilometers per day. But the big thing is you can work in rough terrain. And a lot of the time in South Africa, we're working in incredibly um, thorny terrain, very dense vegetation. You don't have to do any line preparation. You can just arrive and start flying over those thorny bushes and over that rugged terrain. Only limiting factor, of course, is going to be the trees. Trees are always going to be an issue, and you basically have to fly above the highest tree in the area. Another place that's going to be very useful is where it's dangerous. Safety first. Any landmine areas, planes, areas where planes might be shot at, say northern Mozambique. Uh, planes have been known to uh, have pot shots taken at them by drunk soldiers, etc. And a drone, particularly a hexacopter drone, doesn't look particularly threatening. Um, I think if you start using the big fixed wing drones, it starts to look military, and that raises a lot of uh, attention. But these hexacopter drones don't particularly. So there's obvious places where you can use drones very, very successfully, particularly in swampy areas, lots of rivers, rough terrain. And the other thing is by flying low above the ground, you often get better quality data than ground, ground mag. First of all, the MFAM magnetometers that are, in these, that are in this drain have very, very high quality, very, very fast sample speeds. They sample at 1,000 hertz. So you're literally getting 1,000 readings per second. So if you compare that to taking even a walk mag, which takes a reading every two or three meters, that's phenomenal. And you're not close to the laterite, you're not close to the band and iron, whatever, and you actually get a better quality by being above the ground slightly. What are the costs of flying a drone? They're roughly the same as the ground magnetics. So we cannot compete in cost with companies like Excalibur and NRG, but we can compete with ground mag. We do, and it's much faster than ground work. We tend to get better quality data. We don't have to prepare lines. So we fill the gap somewhere between ground surveys and fixed wing surveys or helicopter surveys. In other words, we do small to medium sized surveys that the big companies would not do. Some of the cons of drone magnetics. First of all, we've got something called a line of sight rule, which is being used in every country. They're basically saying, if you can't see the drone, you may not fly it. So you have to turn that drone around. So one of the things you can do is have spotters out in your grid, and you can have them up on hills. You could even have towers. As long as you can see that drone with binoculars or with a naked eye, you're allowed to fly it. So all the rules and regs are coming in, and uh, a lot of company, uh, countries are legislating and trying to make it more and more difficult. They're trying to make it uh, something that they can put into their coffers. So they, they've, typically governments are focusing on and say, how do we get money out of these people? And they're working on that. The problem with line of sight is you often have to fly the survey in small blocks with one flight per block, and then it, it makes sense to change the batteries after that. Trees are a big issue. We've hit trees a couple of times, and that can be a real problem. We're still struggling with battery life. We're using nickel polymers, um, generally 20 to 25 minutes. So you need to carry a full set of batteries. And these batteries cost two to 3,000 Rand each. You need four in the drone, and you need at least six to eight changes to get a day's work in. So it's an expensive business. We need to trial the hybrid fuel battery drone big, uh, drones because they have got much better range and they can fly with fuel, but they're bigger in size and sometimes they look more military. They look like fixed. They look. They kind of look like stealth fighters, and they're going to attract more attention. So right now, a hexacopter is a good way to go, but we're obviously going to look at all sorts of other options. How does the magbo work? Well, that's what it looks like. You can buy it off the shelf, and it has what are called microfabricated atomic magnetometers in them. These tiny, tiny little guys are the success of this drone bird because they're so small. That's a five, five rand coin you're looking at there. It's got two of them in it, and they can be put in different orientations. So if you're flying in the equator, close to the equator and your flight lines are uh, dodgy, so you're not cutting the Earth's magnetic field at the right angle, you can actually orientate them differently. So one will 
couple with the Earth's magnetic field in one direction and the other will couple better in, in the other direction, etc., etc. And also you've got a backup. So if one of them fails, you've got the second one reading all the time as well. Um, Mega con contains two of these MFAMs. They're very, very lightweight. We also have a GPS with one meter accuracy, 10 microsecond timing. And we have this Bosch Honeywell compass. Operating temperature of these drones is from minus 10 to plus 40, which was obviously critical in Africa. I'm going to show you a real life example of a drone survey we've done. This is an area that is two kilometers by 1.4 kilometers in size. Uh, the white outline is the area we're going to fly. And those yellow lines are all high tension power lines. So another good option, another good place to fly a drone is where you've got lots and lots of cultural interference. You can get above the culture, you can fly around the culture, you can even fly underneath power lines if necessary. Of course, you're still going to get the noise, but it ma you manage to get a much quicker survey done when there's areas of lots of culture like this. So this area, at this line spacing of 25 meters, would take 10 days with ground mag. We also managed to reduce the surface noise by flying at 12 meters, and we managed to fly this area in two, two days. So it's five times quicker than ground mag and hopefully much better quality data. Um, so that area is two kilometers in, uh, in length, about 1.4 in width. And you can see what we managed to do here is just cut out the power lines and then noise and managed to get a pretty good survey done in, uh, in two days. This down here, hopefully you can see my mouse, is a Kimberlite pipe. This over here is a Kimberlite dike and this is another Kimberlite. Um, question is, what are these features that are coming out over here? Are they Kimberlites as well? In this particular case, we're looking for dikes and smaller pipes. Some of these big dikes are obviously dolerites. This noise here, I believe, is a dolerite sill. So immediately this data comes off, you can grid it. You get such high quality data from the geometrics that we can kind of grid it as we get it off. Don't really have a diagonal problem with it either. We don't have a line direction problem with it. It's, it's um, doesn't require a lot of compensation in terms of line direction flying. Um, from that, we obviously do all the normal processing, RTP and analytical signal, literally the next day while the client is watching all the others, two VDs, one VDs, and manage to give them a interpretation on top of that very, very quickly, putting the dikes in, putting the sills in. The green objects down here are Kimberlites, we believe. Anything that's in black is dollar art, so we just differentiate like that. The quality is so good that almost no data editing or processing or fooling around is required. So this is a very, very rapid thing that you don't have lots of spikes, you don't have lots of noise. And then at the end of the day, come up with a decent um, uh, interpretation and within three days, the client is, is looking at trenching and doing stuff. So um, that's an example of a survey we've done with a drone for Kimberlite pipes and Kimberlite dikes. What about other uses for drones? Firstly, we need to start using fuel hybrids for longer range. This 25 minute range is, is painful. Obviously the, the line of sight is painful too. These are things we've got to work on. But fuel hybrids are the way to go so that we can get away from this constant battery charging and we can start getting a two to three hour flight time. And hopefully in certain countries get special permits so that we don't have to stick to line of sight. You do have a forward looking camera on these drones. So what happens is while the pilot's flying, he's got a spot for trees on his iPad or whatever he's using, whatever tablet he's using, and look for trees coming up and literally dodge around them or go over them. So it becomes a very high, it's quite a stressful thing to do, particularly in an area where there are trees in say tropical Africa. And we've been known to fly into a tree where we destroyed the cameras. Luckily the bird is tough and it just took a knock and a bit of damage, but uh, we had to wait a couple of days to get new cameras. And you can't always buy these cameras in places like Angola. You have to ship them in from South Africa. Other, other great uses, obviously, even very high resolution photography, which everyone knows about and we've been doing. Digital terrain models. The drone has an altimeter and we have very good GPS, so we can start to create those. Frequency domain EM is coming. It's already been done in a couple of instances. In America, basically, if you have a small frequency domain, shallow seeing instrument, you can sling it beneath a large drone and you can fly very low. 
and you can maybe map the top few few meters of the earth, say in the case of, of nickel laterites or for geotechnical uses and even looking for stuff, simple stuff like uh, power lines, pipelines, etc. Hyperspectral scanners is the other very, very obvious one with already hyperspectral and multispectral cameras that you can sling on a drone. Then take your processing to the next level and look for magnesium and look for alteration and basically create an alteration map. So now I'm going to get onto the ground penetrating radar and give you some examples of what we've done there in terms of alluvial diamonds, as well as using the drone. Obviously, this is well known in the engineering application, like finding water mains and cables. That's called utility scanning. And a lot of people do that already. But these are very shallow applications and they only work on smooth pavement and roads. What you need for geological work with GBR is something that will work in rough terrain in rugged terrain and that does not need to be coupled to the ground. Now most radar, most high resolution radar is coupled to the ground. You need an air coupled uh, radar instrument. Essentially it's an electromagnetic technique, it sends out an electromagnetic pulse if you like. One receives a reflection theoretically, it's a bit like seismics. One converts time to distance just like seismics and converts that to the distance to the reflector. And as you walk along, this creates a reflective surface, very similar to seismics. But we're not depending on density here. We're not depending on um, uh, acoustic impedance or anything like that. We, are de we depend on the, the dielectric constant of the substrate. And we need a contrast, just like every other geophysical technique. So you need a big dielectric constant contrast. And the trouble is that water and wet clays are often a big problem. So anything conductive is a problem with GPR, particularly in the geological realm. Works just like radar, I mean, uh, sorry, works just like um, seismics. You essentially have a contrast on your left. This thing is making, cup is coupling with the ground. We get a reflection if you like. Some of the signal goes through, some of it comes back up. You get what looks like a parabola and then just like seismics, you have to do migration and map your reflectors. A radar image looks very much like a seismic image. Utilities work all looks like this. The, the orange guy makes contact with the ground. And if you use ultra high frequency like this little handheld over here, these things go right up to three gigahertz in terms of frequency. So these are what we call high frequencies with radar, 300 megahertz to three gigahertz. Um, on the right hand side, this guy is looking for rebar in concrete. So if you've got a contractor that swore he was going to put this much reinforcing into your concrete, but nobody checked, you can come along with this little utility scanner and you can tell the client exactly how much rebar is in that concrete because you're going to get this massive reflection every time you see a piece of metal reinforcing. And obviously you can use it on mines and other places, you can map potholes and all that. But what we wanted to do was go for something different into the geological realm. Uh, roads are very obvious other um, use for radar, slightly lower frequency than the rebar. And what you're trying to do now is see how deep the road base is and how, how good the road base looks. Does it have a whole lot of, bunch of kinks in it? Does it have holes in it? And have they stuck to the contracts in terms of making the road? Classic parabola, usually over a pipeline or something like that, and you have to flatten that out, but usually your pipeline would, or your cable would be right in there at the top of the parabola. But we want to see deep and we want to do geology and we want to be able to walk this thing over rough terrain. So we're looking at low frequency antennas under 120 megahertz, down to 12 and a half megahertz is doable, even 25, um, 40 megahertz is a good, good place to start. But you pay the price, like with every geophysical technique, the trade-off is resolution. You can see how long that sensor is there. The, um, the transmitter is two meters long because it's 40 megahertz, but at least now you can walk over rough terrain and hopefully see down at least 15 meters and not just three meters. The other thing you can do on the rough terrain option is have a rough terrain cart. You can, instead of carrying it, you can mount it on a sort of a four wheel drive pram, if you like, have your console um, right in front of you and it's much easier to work with it like this. So we built something that looks like this uh, with the use of help from Terry. We bought a cart and then we modified it and we're able to use these really big wheels. And it's just like a motorbike or a, a mountain bike. The bigger the wheel is, the more rough terrain you can handle and the higher that thing is off the ground. 
you need to get this antenna within 20, 30 centimeters of the ground for it to work, but at least it's air coupled and doesn't have to touch the ground. So that's what we call a rough terrain cart. So, so here's some comparisons of looking really deep. You can see on the right with 40 megahertz, this is a perfect, perfect test area, a basin in Sweden where everything is incredibly resistive. What you're looking for is very, very resistive terrain with dielectric contrast. Conductive terrain doesn't work with, with radar. If you look on the right, we're seeing down to 100 meters. And on the left with a 40 megahertz antenna, you're seeing down to about 70 meters. And I think you'll agree that they're both seeing the sedimentary basin very, very nicely. There's obviously dolomites here and very resistive sandstones. What you don't want in your geological profile is silts that are clay rich. You don't want shales that are clay rich. You don't want any strongly conductive features because that's where you're gonna stop signal penetration. It's just like EM. You don't want anything conductive on surface or near surface. So this is what we're after, this kind of geological information. Clay layers, shallow fractured bedrock, maybe some faults, and be able to map the geology like this using a 40 megahertz antenna. Of course, this is ideal and you very seldom get this. <clears throat> alluvial gravel mapping is something that we get constantly asked about. There are so many alluvial diamond miners in Southern Africa all the way up to the DRC. And they are forever asking about ways that they can map their alluvials, see how deep they are, and separate them from areas where there's no gravel, but just silt and sand. The silt and sand doesn't contain diamonds. You need coarse gravel. And you can do clever things like phase, just like with seismics, you can do phase processing. And in this particular case, on the left, you can see, top left, you can see really, really nice depression with some gravels in it then a whole lot of high ground, and then on your right, there's a gravel terrace. Now, often these terraces are flat lying. They, are where, they occur where the, um, where the gravel was, where the river was once, but now the river's migrated. So this gravel on your left is in the main channel, but often these guys are looking for raised terraces. So this is one of the main reasons we want to use radar, because gravels don't have any other signature. They very seldom have a strong magnetic signature, even though they have some ilmenite in them. And some heavy minerals, they, have, they may have a slight sort of ripple texture magnetics, but they don't have much you can work with in terms of other geophysical techniques. Gravity sometimes works, but that it depends on having a dense bedrock. And then your gravels must be much lighter than that. So you've got to take a multi-pronged approach, look at various techniques, and then use a radar in support. Here's a real-life example near Lichtenberg. We were asked to help these guys find gravel on their... Um, diamond bearing gravel on the particular prospect here, which is marked in white. You can see the town of Lichtenberg down there. And this is, a, anyone who knows this area will know that Bakerville, which was this little town over here, is the place to be in terms of uh, diamond alluvials. These have been running since the late, since the early 1900s, these gravels, and people are still working there and still making money. So that's what the property looks like. That's what the, um, the mag contours look like, the airborne mag. There's a dike, um, these black contours are mag. There's a dike running there and there's a dike running there. We know that up front from the regional era mag, but these, that's not helping us. We're looking for very, very subtle signature of alluvial gravels. That's just how we started looking at the area. What geology do we have? And then we flew the drone. Now, why would you fly a drone when you're looking for gravels? Well, I alluded to the fact that there's heavy minerals in some of these gravels and we know for a fact that there's a lot of ilmenite in them. Very few garnets and CDs and other things, but there is some ilmenite. So what we what we decided to do was fly the area of the drone first, get rid of the get rid of the dolerites, which you can clearly see there, and then look for a faint, faint sort of ripple texture and something else, very, very textural type signature, like over here where you're getting some features. And we isolated these three areas: area one, area two, and area three that looked like a good starting point to start doing some ground geophysics. Um, lo and behold, when we went to area one, we found that there are in fact some linear looking vegetation anomalies, there, but the guys told us those linear vegetation anomalies mean nothing. If you look on the left of the satellite image, you can see, uh, let me just go back one. On the left of the satellite image, you can see they've been working gravels there, but they haven't been able to get onto this property yet. These are our e EM profiles. So we decided we're going to use shallow seeing e EM. Nothing deep because we just want to look in the top 10 meters, see what these things are telling us. 
Now these could just be fractures or joints in the dolomite. They, they're putting up water and trees are growing on them. So they don't necessarily mean anything, but it was nice to see them identified from the mag initially. Um, so we took a two pronged approach here on the ground. We're gonna run the radar and we're gonna run um, CMD4, shallow seeing EM, do some profiles and see what we could come up with for these guys and, and give them a place to start trenching. So these are the lines we did. You can see in red there, we did radar and EM on those black lines and on those red lines. And you can see on the mag, particularly in this area, there's some north-south trending features here that are of interest. And in this side, they're actually east-to-west or slightly east-northeast trending. So the mag, when you look at it more closely, is starting to show some features that agree with uh, what we're seeing in the satellite image, but we need to locate these things properly on the ground and see if they have merit in the EM and the radar. So here's a real life example of the shallow seeing EM. Now these guys don't have a lot of money, diamond alluvial guys. They don't say do a whole area for me. They very much just, just do a couple of profiles. That's what we see, which is a pain. As geophysicists like to do big areas and we like to have composite grids that we can deal with. So we managed to kind of do grids here, but this was done very, very quickly. And this is the EM conductivity from the CMD4. Now you can see there's linear features coming out here, which is very promising in the north-south direction. Now remember in the north-south direction, there was nothing on the satellite image, but there was in the mag. And over here, we're starting to see some linear east-south, uh, or what we say west-south-west trending uh, conductors coming out over there and these north-south ones. So okay, this looks great, let's run some radar. Now what we saw on the radar, now Dolomite is a fantastic place to run radar um, because it's so resistive. Dolomite is all around a very good rock. It likes gravity and it likes, uh, it likes radar. And what we found was we're getting these amazing multiple reflexes where we've got hard Dolomite. They even look like they've got fabric in them, like the texture of the Dolomite in the church, because anyone who's looked at Dolomite closely knows that it has these stromatolytic sort of dome-like features in them. So it looks amazingly like Dolomite. A lot of them are just multiples, but what was interesting was you get these sudden quiet gaps in the radar. And these of, of course become, um, the question becomes what in fact are these? Are they just dikes, are they joints? But they're pretty wide. You see, looking at meters on the scale up here, we're looking at 135 meters to 155 meters. That's quite wide for a dike. And we know that it doesn't have a strong magnetic signature. The magnetic signature was very, very, very subtle on these features. That's why we thought they might be joints or filled with gravel. And um, if they were good dolerite dikes that have a strong magnetic signature, we know the dolerite areas in this place and they, this does not have a strong magnetic signature on it. Here's another example, much narrower. This one is only 10 meters wide from 55 meters to 65 in a sea of dolomite. And you're seeing all these amazing fabrics in the dolomite again. So what the heck are these features and do they coincide with the EM? It's gonna be our first check. Here we're seeing, although it's a, um, a quieter area, we're seeing some structure in this quiet area. And what is possible is that we've got a kind of a sinkhole at depth here, or some feature at depth where there's a little bit of muck filling in the sinkhole above it, but down below we've just got silts and sands. So there's some, some, some sort of a wad or manganiferous uh, uh, rubbish, like rubble, dolomite filling in this, what could be a sinkhole. And further on in other areas, we had these very, very quiet zones where we have these strong parabolic reflectors and they're deep. I mean, we're seeing down seven and a half meters, five meters to seven and a half meters here. Some of them are shallow. What in fact are these? They have classic parabolas, they're almost big boulders. And this actually ties in with good gravels where you have these large boulders and then you have much smaller, poorly sorted matrix of boulders around. Um, all of it of high interest to us um, looking for alluvials. Another example, we get lots and lots of parabolic reflexes and maybe from larger boulders in an otherwise quite silty area. Some area that's silty and sandy, and yet we're getting these strong parabolas in there, also down at seven and a half meters, eight meters. So this stuff's starting to look quite interesting. And you can see this is a north-south line, probably crossing those east-west features. So when I overlay all of this, well, when I overlay those quiet areas or those what look like boulder ribbon areas in the GPR, those are the black lines where we get those areas. And you can see they are overlying the CMD4 
conductivity pretty darn well. If you look at this area here, that's 100% agreement. That's 100% agreement because it was a conductor clean through there. Areas like this, where we're getting good agreement. And there's another area where the radar and the ground conductivity are corresponding very, very strongly. In general, we see good correspondence. They're not all gonna be gravels, but things like this, which correspond to the vegetation anomalies are starting to become quite interesting. And bigger areas like this, because we know you get in these gravels, things called potholes. And that is where the gravel run suddenly widens out. You've got a big sinkhole, and now we're getting this strong conductive feature, which is quite large here. And the whole thing has got those parabolic reflectors in it. So it's starting to look interesting. When I put it all together, it looks ugly as hell, but we were able to process um, the EM, the mag, and the, uh, the radar together, come up with a couple of drill sites, and well, actually trench sites in these cases, put them onto it, and Area 1 delivered the goodies. The very first area we gave them had diamond-bearing alluvials for the client. So I don't think anyone was more amazed than we were, because this was the first kind of time we were doing this sort of work. But by identifying rippled areas with the mag magnetics, going into the EM and the, and the radar, getting quite a bit of support between those two and then getting these parabolic reflectors and these, these quiet alluvial zones um, seems to have paid dividends. And these guys put trenches clean across some of those things and they found diamond bearing alluvials. The end, thank you very much for your patience. Thanks, Gavin. You caught me in the middle of supper. <laughs> My husband <laughs> me supper while you were talking. Um, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I, mean, I can see some in the chat. Usually on Teams, you have to type your questions and then I would read them out. But please feel free um, to unmute yourself and ask. It's so much more interactive. I would say put up your hand, but I have no idea how to put up your hand on Zoom. So put it up if you know how to. Um, yeah. Can um, I? Yes, and then I'll read Naraka. Either you can speak your question or I'll read it out after this one. But yes, please ask. So is it Louis? It's, it's Louis here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, just for, to Gavin, uh, the re reliability of drones is still, is still a bit of an issue. What, do you think that's going to improve as we go along? Um, when you say reliability, are you talking about the drone crashing or are you talking about the major That's right. I'm talking problem? about the drone crashing and how long do they go without behave before having failures and things like that. You know, if you, if you look at the literature, they're talking about, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the numbers, but a, a failure of about every two or three hundred hours or something like that, you know. So, so that's obviously, you know, the moment you start putting your physical equipment and that's got any value, you just need to be a bit careful, yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, Louis, uh, as I say, we've flown into a tree. That was not the drone's fault, um, but there are definitely issues with flying drones. Yeah. Battery life is uh, obviously an issue. If, you, if you're yeah. going to push the battery life, you're going to crash too. And yeah. thirdly, um, the actual failure of the motor um, or the, the electronics on the drone does happen. So I can only say that I believe that you've got to start somewhere and things are going to improve with time particularly as we move to the fuel hybrids, which are much more expensive, yeah. but are actually fuel driven. Uh, the problem with a fuel driven motor is of course, if you do have a bad accident, you could start a fire. So there's a lot of issues to deal with with drones, but just like when we started geophysical surveying with aircraft and got safer and safer and better and better, it's only a matter of improving and the technology improving and particularly with the guys who make drones realizing what we're using them for to lift heavy yeah. loads. Now, initially, they were like, oh, we'll just put a light camera on there. You know, they, they don't know about geophysics, the guys that make drones. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with yeah, no. time, things are going to get better and better. Definitely. And, and I think there's definitely a, there's definitely a market for, for this kind of geophysical operations. Yeah. Well done. Good, good talk. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. Thanks, Louis. Uh, um, Gavin. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, it, um, it's Oleg on this side. Um, I just have a comment and I have a question for Gavin. Um, well, my comment basically revolves around the fact I just wanted to comment for Stephanie, Brad and Gavin for keeping cool under extremely stressful situation where literally nothing was working in MS team and well done guys, I'm really proud of you. Um, and my question is, uh, Gavin, what's your feel for the required line kilometers 
uh, to make the draw make feasible. And um, what are the current CAA requirements for the drone survey? Um, so the line kilometers, um, essentially when, line, when ground mag starts becoming too, much, too onerous. So it, most guys will do say a 200 kilometer line kilometer ground survey, it might take them 20 days. But after that, they go, no, nah, this is ridiculous. Um, what it's going to cost me to keep my people there fed and watered, the fuel for the vehicles, um, and the terrain is rough. You know, 20 days is getting too much to do a ground mag survey. And if we can do that in two or three days with a drone at the same price and potentially get better data, so they, they're going to go for it, and people are. So I would say that after about 100 to 200 line kilometers, people are going to go, no, let's, let's start looking at the drones, particularly in rough terrain dangerous terrain, um, mountainous terrain, um, and any terrain where it's very difficult to move around, like rainforest, which is obviously ridiculous because the trees are too high there. But uh, let's say dense scrub, for example. We often work in areas where the bush is so thick and the thorns are so bad. So yeah, 200 kilometers onwards to the place where NRG and Excalibur will start consider doing the survey, which is a couple of thousand kilometers. So we're filling that gap between 200 line kilometers and say 2,000 is a good, good um, way to put it maybe. I mean, the mobilization of an NRG or an Excalibur is just ridiculous to get to a place like that, whereas we just jump in a car and we drive there for a couple of thousand rand. The other thing, the other question you asked was, um, sorry, what, what was the CA, what was the CA what, requirements? What, yeah. yeah. First of all, you may not fly within, I think it's 50 kilometers of any aerodrome or, or landing strip or airport obviously and you have to get a license or a permit to fly and you and you have to have fully qualified pilots that go for testing every every year and get their permit updated so it's quite onerous and in south africa already they're clamping down on pilots that's why it's well worth I mean, having a professional pilot on your books but if you go to places like zambia we try to fly a, a drone survey in the pit at transanchi now i mean that's just in a pit, it's not gonna affect anybody. But the government got wind of it and shut it down immediately because they said, look, we haven't had time to legislate drones. We wanna make money from drones. You can't just go fly this, we're watching you sort of thing. Australia, we've had to shut, not us, but um, I know uh, Lauren tried to fly a drone survey in Australia for First Quantum. And the line of sight rule, which he believes could be sort of, or, or people believe can be utilize you can use binoculars and viewing towers the guys the cia came along and said no 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 no. if you can't see it with the naked eye forget it you've got to turn around and that sort of messed the whole survey up so the problem we've got is that the, the legislation's in its infancy governments are just feeling their way they're trying to work out how to you know try and hamstring us get in our way and charge us so right now in south africa it's quite onerous but if you go to places like Botswana. Uh, where you're flying out yep. in a horn and there's not a person there, is there's kind of no reason why you can't just fly a low-level drone survey. But all countries are going to legislate and make it more and more onerous as time goes on. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Gavin. Okay. Can I interrupt there? Just say, because Sue has very patiently had her hand up, and then I've got two chat questions from Naraka and uh, Gordon, and then Brad's got a question, and then Reese's hand is up. So, Gavin, you're not getting another beer anytime soon. So, Sue, do you want to go first? Hi, hi, Gavin. Thanks, thanks for a great talk. I missed a little bit at the beginning, um, but uh, I wanted to ask about: um, Do you see any opportunities for opening up new markets um, with with the drone activities, and even with the the deeper penetrating uh, ground penetrating radar? And what can we do to help facilitate opening up newer markets? How do you mean, market, Sue? An example. Um, the alluvial diamond people haven't traditionally used geophysics for much, so that's one group of people. And I'm I'm wondering if there's others that um, are perhaps in, you know asking about um, surveys that you might not generally you know do surveys for. Right. Okay. Sorry, I get you now. So alluvial diamonds is the obvious one. For a long time, we were not able to help those people. We just don't have the aside from gravity. We were really struggling to help him. A bit of EM. And the gravity and the mag has definitely gained some interest, particularly by fluke, as you might say, or serendipitously, we had um, good success early on. But the other place it's, it's coming to the fore very strongly is in geotechnical work. Now, 
I know a lot of guys in exploration don't like to get into geotechnical work, but I tell you, that is where our geophysics markets are opening up. Things like locating and flying areas for pipelines, um, big power stations, uh, areas. Uh, radar has got a huge application for the geotechnical market because traditionally we do resistivity and gravity and those kind of things. But radar is, is coming along. It's much, much faster than gravity. I mean, you can cover with a mobile radar uh, in hours what will take you days with gravity. So again, it comes down to speed. Um, and gra unfortunately, radar only works some of the time. It doesn't like to work in conductive areas. It doesn't like sand and soil. It doesn't like a lot of stuff. But things are going to improve. You've just got to start, start with it and start hacking away and get some good case studies going, I think. Thanks, Gavin. Um, now I forgot, oh, Naraka's question was next. I'm just scrolling up to it. Um, quite a few technical details, questions about those. So she said, your mag data looks really good. Did you need a base station or a tie line? What are the typical noise levels for the system and what makes it lower? How do you deal with the swing of the receiver for each line and how big an effect does it have on this sort of mag system? I can read them each to you again. So first question yeah, no, was base station no, and tie line. Okay. So yes, uh, obviously you, you run it like a normal mag survey. You run a base station and you run tie lines. But what we found is that the, the quality of the mag we get off the, the geometrics is so good that um, even though you go through those motions and you make sure you do everything properly, uh, you get such a good map straight off the bird that um, I won't say it's unnecessary because that would be a crazy thing to say. It is necessary to run all those things and always have them. But you do get um, you do get fantastic results straight off it. Uh, there's almost no issues with lag because of its amazing sampling speed, and there's apparently that we can find no issue with line direction. Um, so that kind of compensation doesn't seem to be a big issue. Although you've got to always do your tire lines, you've always got to run your base mag, particularly to obviously you've got to monitor for magnetic storms. Dealing with the swing of the bird. Um, it's always going to swing slightly on the flight line, but what happens is because it's aerodynamic, as soon as you gain speed with the, with the hexacopter, it starts flying in a straight line. And if there's a strong crosswind, it'll just go offline a little bit. As you come to the end of the line, and you saw him rotate in that first video, um, it swings a lot, but now you're off the survey. It's just, like, um, it's just like flying a plane. You make sure you're well out of the survey area by the time you stop and you turn around, and then you clip that data out. But quite frankly, all you see is a whole bunch of data there and you, you just clip it out. It doesn't really do, it doesn't spike or do anything insane when you turn it around. So it's a very well behaved magnetometer. Uh, what were the other questions? I think you answered most of it. The base station tie lines, typical noise level of the system and what makes it ah, yeah. Noise level, very, very, very low. I've uh, been impressed. It's like about, uh, again, it depends on what, if you're just talking electronic noise, it's well under 0.1 nanoceptors. Um, but obviously you get some kind of a geological noise if you're flying low over laterite or anything busy like that, but noise stipple, which is actually coming from the geology. But if you just fly along in a straight line high up, which is the real test, um, uh, noise is minute. I, mean, that's, I would say it's actually moving down to like 0.05 of a nanoceptor. Thanks. Gordon's question also links in with noise levels. So it says, um, how much are mag noise levels correlated with ambient wind speeds? Just on this, uh, Gavin, I spoke to you a while back because I was working with the guys in Zim who are using the drones. And they said they were, having, they were having to wait for quiet days where there was less wind. I don't know if you've had the same issues. Look, flying in wind is um, not just because of noise, but extremely difficult because it's it's hard to fly the darn thing in the wind and the birds being blown to one side. So a strong wind is going to blow it offline all the time. Good pilots, are, you know, can rapidly come to uh, deal with that. The actual noise level um, comes up. Obviously, you get a, a kind of a, a noise envelope because of, of essentially the bird is rocking back and forth. So you're getting not swing, but um, maybe a little bit of porpoising and definitely some yaw. So you get you get more noise, but it, it goes up to say half a nanotesla, maybe maximum one nanotesla in a strong wind, as long as you can fly in the wind. But the problem is any strong wind, really strong wind, you can't fly in it. Okay, thanks. I'm just drawing, Sue, to draw your attention to Tian's response in the chat about some alternative um, 
think that this method can be used for. So uh, Tian says, Cass Lotta has been using drone made very successfully in, in the Western Cape for ground surveys and Billy's Tian Camp has found or surveyed shipwrecks in the surf and shallow, shallow seas. That must be very interesting. <laughs> um, Brad, you said you had some questions and then Reese. Yeah, um, hi Gavin, great talk. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, the one is, I was just wondering what altimeter you had on the uh, mag arrow. Was it a, um, a radar or laser altimeter? What is the... It's a, it's a laser. laser. A, a laser, okay, yeah. yeah. And then just, um, you spoke a lot about the trees. Um, a lot of the, and even the DJI, DJI recreational drones have uh, crash avoidance uh, on them. Um, is this uh, not working or because of the speed you're flying or is it something that uh, it, it, it uh, hampers your actual uh, survey production? Um, it's actually a question. I don't know if Bjorn is online here. Are you, are you here, Bjorn? I don't think, I don't think Bjorn is here. Um, I'm not 100% sure of that. I'll get back to you. My understanding is that the pilot feels that he is better than that and he would rather handle it himself. I mean, they're really good, these guys. But again, his reaction time has to be massively fast because of the forward-looking camera bringing it up and then going around it or over it. Um, I don't know why he doesn't use the crash avoidance or if he does and suddenly just manually overrides. I'll, I'll double check on that for you. Okay. Thanks. If that's all, Brad. Um, Reese, you had questions. And then Gormo, I'm sorry, I didn't see your request for a question. So after Reese, you can go. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Kevin. Those are great examples. Um, in a previous life, I had exposure to flying drones, not personally, but with the company and GPR. And one of the struggles we were having, and uh, there were some questions around it earlier, was the licensing, but not particularly the pilot's license, the RPL, but the ROC, the Remote Operating Certificate. And essentially, the CIA was not issuing any new certificates at that stage. There were about, as far as I was aware, 10 companies in South Africa that were licensed at that stage. Um, are you able to comment on whether that process has been unlocked at all? Um, as I say, we use professional pilots that get registered every year. So I believe they found a way to, to get it done. Unless they're pulling the wool over our eyes, they do tell us they've got everything. So, yeah, Gavin, um, that's the RPL. That's the remote pilot license. The ROC okay. is a certification for the company and the drone to operate. So there are two separate things. Oh, oh, oh the, yes, yeah, definitely it's been unlocked. We're managing to get that stuff done now, yeah. Okay, that's good news. Good yeah. news for the industry as a whole. It is, yeah. Um, Thanks okay. very much. Thanks, Reese. Um, I see uh, the person called Gomo's is actually Sikalela. Um, if you're there, you can ask a question. Uh, hi everyone, and thanks Kevin for the nice talk. I have a question mainly related on uh, the Kimberlite exploration, that is pipe Kimberlite exploration. So uh, I saw that on the intro of the talk that it was mentioned that you also do GPR on Kimberlite exploration. And then my question was based on, on the fact that considering that Kimberlites mainly contain three Faces, which is your crater, your the metric, and your hyper, 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 hyper faces, and then only crater faces mainly consist or contain a considerable dielectric constant. Is it really worth it to conduct GPR, GPR surveys in pipe kimberlite exploration? And also considering that. Kimberlite material, material normally weathers easily. So it forms a lot of clays and stuff which are very conductive and you find that conductive layer at the top. So which can affect the results that you get with, with GPR. So I wanted to ask how feasible and how worth it is it to conduct GPR surveys in uh, Kimberlite exploration? Thank you. Uh, the answer is not very successful on pipes, no. Um, for all the reasons you yourself have pointed out, the actual hard kimberlite um, is very much the same dielectric constant as the country rock often. And the weathered surface area, the yellow ground, etc., is conductive. So we haven't done a lot of work on pipes. I mean, all of this is still being tried and trialed. 
the only success or reasonable success we've had is on dikes, as you saw, uh, or alluvials. Um, so no, we haven't done much on, on pipes, and the little bit we have done has been unsuccessful. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks, Galela. Following on from that, Gavin, uh, it's very nice to have Glenn here. Glenn is from WITS, and so he's a geologist who dabbles um, quite seriously in geophysics, and so he's asked, um, and it, I suppose the, you've answered on with the GPR, on existing diamondiferous kimberlites, such as Arapa, how useful is drone-based geophysics on mapping work contacts? Can you overlay survey data done using drones on face mapping data, considering the resolution and the scale? Well, that would only work if there's a strong magnetic susceptibility uh, difference between your facies types that you're trying to map. And the way to check that would be to go and use a handheld susceptibility meter and check your face for that. It would be just as easy to do that initial work as it would be to fly the drone. But let's say you had a very magnetic hyperbyssal fasces adjacent to something that was non-magnetic, then obviously it would work. So it all comes down to the usual, is the contrast in place? And the way to find that out would be to do your homework with a magnetic susceptibility meter in the pit first. But getting to fly in a pit is so difficult. You've got to get rid of your trucks and uh, your, I mean, you could do it, but the mine would have to be fairly convinced that they want to do, give you a quiet time to do it in. Thanks, Gavin. Reese, another question? And then we'll maybe draw to a close. Uh, thanks, Steph. Uh, Gavin, just another question around the flying of the drone. Do you pre-plan the lines and load that onto the drone to fly autonomously? and just intervene for collision avoidance? Yes. So you, you start with a very, very accurate DTM, um, and obviously a satellite image showing all the culture and high buildings and power lines. And then you plan the lines down to the last meter and you program that into the drone. So the drone actually flies automatically from the get-go. You actually plan each flight and you make it as long as the battery life. Then you use it, then my understanding is the pilot just uses the forward looking camera for any emergency intervention, but essentially he, the, the thing flies itself automatically. And you, you set the height it must fly it, you can drape it above the terrain, and you can tell it up front to go up high over a power line, etc. like that. It's, the entire thing is computer driven. It's very, very clever. And just another question, if I may, Steph. Um, are you providing a high resolution DTM using any of the photogrammetric methods that are available from the drone? So do you, do you have a, a downward facing camera essentially? No, but um, what we do is we offer it um, to people and um, it's definitely something we want to make part of our portfolio and do it on an expert level, mm -hmm. but, the, but we haven't done it properly yet, no. Okay. We only supply a DTM from GPS and altimeter. So it's a typical sort of uh, derived G DTM like that, but not from photogrammetry. We haven't. But I mean, the potential is there. And all, the, all of these camera-based potentials are there. You've just got to start doing them. Mm. Yeah, because that could be used for the face mapping, referring to that question that was posed earlier. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of... It's, it's one of these things where the uses or, or, the, new, or the new ideas are going to come as you start doing it. You won't think of it initially, and then you'll say, hang on a minute. Hell, we were flying in the pit the other day, and what I realize now is, you know, that kind of thing. So you can't always think of all the end uses for drones. It's, and we're just at the beginning, but um, we're going to find a lot of amazing uses. And one that I, I always love to refer to at the end of the talk is, particularly in the winelands of South Africa, where Chardonnay is best grown on a certain kind of soil with high alkalinity and Sauvignon Blanc is best grown on a different soil. Drones and hyperspectral and multispectral cameras are really coming into their own on the winelands and these guys have money. So you fly just above your, your vineyards and you, you hyperspectrally map the soils and then you come up with the exact sort of uh, composition of your soil. How much clay there is and which clay is kaolin, this much magnesium, that much calcium. And then you tell the guys, you actually map the best grape growing areas for them like that. So that is one area that maybe we would not even have dreamt of a couple of years ago, although I believe people did. I know Rafe and Rensberg is doing um, lots of stuff like that for farmers, agricultural use of radiometrics. So it's, it, we're literally just advancing along this path. And 
in answer to Sue's question, I've just thought now that agriculture is going to be a massive, massive thing that we do with drones and multispectral um, cameras soon. And again, they're going to need geophysicists and geologists to do this because we're the only guys who are actually going to understand what this camera is telling us. Um, thanks, Gavin. I just wanted to, and Reese, I just wanted to read Jeff's question that he typed. Uh, he just said, in his experience with low frequency GPR of 40 megahertz in South Africa, um, there's been two limitations. Well, most surveys are defeated by either a conductive weather zone or a conductive host rock of less than 200 ohm meters, such that the depth of penetration is generally less than 5 to 10 meters. Have you found the same uh, thing, Gavin? Absolutely. I mean, Jeff's 100% right. Um, we haven't had a huge amount of success with low frequency radar. And the only one or two places where we've had success is on extremely resistive background, where you're looking for something specific in resistive background. So it's got a long way to go, but we keep trying it. And every now and again, you do have some success. But what we tend to do is almost throw the radar in for free or very, very low cost on top of other techniques. And then if we get lucky and it's really working well, then we can start charging for it. But generally, we're feeling our way with radar and it does have severe limitations, exactly as Jeff has pointed out. Sue, your hand is up for one last question. Oh, yeah, guys, come I, on. I, I, hi, Gavin. I just wanted to ask about um, these new, the newer gravity sensors. Um, are they similar to these new mag sensors that are so light? I know they, you know, the new MEM sensors, but I, I don't think they're sensitive enough. But have you thought about um, the gravity applications yet? Well, obviously, obviously they would be fantastic, and we would be very interested. As far as I know, they are nowhere near the resolution we require. And, and um, but I may be wrong. Maybe you've done more research into them than I have. Um, but obviously to get them on a drone, to get every single geophysical technique onto a drone is the way we want to go. And this, this miniaturization is 100% the right way that everybody's going. So it's only a matter of time. They're going to come up with a gravimeter sensor very, very soon that can go on a drone and will have decent resolution and decent sensitivity. So as far as I know, we're not there yet, but we'll keep watching that space. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Gavin, and thanks for all the answers to the questions. Am I allowed to share a comment slash story <laughs> about my sure. experience with drones? So at the beginning of last year, I got an email from a company saying, hi, we found you on YouTube because I have some YouTube videos for the students on magnetics. Will you come to Zimbabwe and teach us about magnetics? We're buying a drone <laughs> to put a magnetometer. Yeah, We've got drones. Weird. We're buying magnetometer to put on the drone. Um, so I thought if I went to Zim, they might sell me on the black market. But turned out they were a legitimate company and they paid for me and my husband and daughter to go up to Harari and tell them about magnetics. So Gavin, I think you know the group. Um, yes. And they are surveyors and do more agricultural stuff. Um, but like you said, they definitely need a geophysicist and geologist, which they've now realized, um, to help them understand what the heck they're collecting <laughs> data-wise. Um, I think right. they thought they could just throw something on the drone and hope for the best. So it was a very yeah, interesting experience. And I came back alive. I was quite excited and they were very nice guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're getting so many cowboys. Um, it's the usual story. All the cowboys are jumping on the bandwagon and going, oh, we'll just sling a drone beneath or whatever. I mean, a, a mag bird. And they honestly have no idea what this thing is doing and um, what it gives and how to interpret it and how to deal with it. They're all just cowboys. So it's our duty now as Saga to start start putting the word out there that drone magnetics is for geophysicists and um, there's that that clients must not have their wool pulled over their eyes by these guys that are just just selling them something but actually are not selling you know giving them the product that they they're hoping for and if they don't have a geophysicist involved then saga needs to be you know putting the word out there and saying listen guys you're getting ripped off by these cowboys you need to you need to make sure there's geologists and geophysicists on the team. Otherwise, you are literally not going to get what you're hoping for. Yeah, and, and like you said, the instruments are so good, you get very good data out. But what does the data mean? So, yeah, yeah I think they learned that lesson. Maurice, your hand was up for absolute last. Gavin really wants to go get another beer. <laughs> Promise. 
Yeah, I was just going to comment on the um, discussion around GPR in civil engineering as well. And it's similar to where we are now with drones and various sensors being put onto those platforms where the acquisition is almost at the point where it's so turnkey that anyone can do it. It yeah. doesn't require much expertise. GPR is a little bit further down the line. But you said, you know, geophysics isn't being applied in civil engineering. And I'd like to counter that because it is, it is being extensively applied in civil engineering. Just the practitioners applying it don't consider themselves geophysicists, or they aren't. And there's no more fancy processing or anything done than just picking a, a parabolic or a hyperbolic um, reflection. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a problem. So that's where where against, Saga needs to step in and, and make the community bigger. I agree. And I think these are the functions Saga should really get into, and which is, is going to the geotechnical meetings, the AGMs, and giving talks and saying, look, you guys, you're using all these geophysical techniques, but you don't employ a single geophysicist to have a look at the data. You really need to start talking to us. Um, so yeah, Saga, these are the kind of roles Saga should play and, and almost like an oversight role where we make sure that our clients who are using geophysics are actually making sure they've got geophysicists on board and people that know what they're looking at. We should bring our clients to the next Saga conference. Yeah, yeah, geotechnical clients, exactly. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Gavin, for the talk for, I think, this, this last point here is possibly something that we have to need to have a saga talk or discussion on uh, itself. Um, so we will put that on the list. Everyone, please keep an eye out for the email about the saga AGM in November. Uh, we would love to hear you all there and see you all on Zoom. Um, otherwise, have a good weekend. Please stay safe. And yeah, next time you see Gavin when coronavirus is all sorted, we'll buy your drink, Gavin, to say thank you for the talk. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. Bye bye. But thanks. And um, yeah, we will load this talk on YouTube and you're welcome to share it um, with colleagues. And yeah, have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting. <laughs>